Kia ora. Earlier this week, the mission hosted over 20 leading American universities for the second US Universities Fair in Auckland. Representatives from distinguished American universities, including Caltech, New York University, and Chapman University, spoke to over 1,000 interested Kiwi students about studying in the US. Associate Professor of Entertainment Law Judd Funk was at the fair on Saturday, representing California's Chapman University School of Law and the George College of Film and Media Arts. Previous to teaching at Chapman University, Judd was an attorney and senior executive in the movie and entertainment industry for nearly 30 years, where he's written over 300 films, including Star Wars, Jurassic Park, and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Judd now joins me in a much smaller film studio at the US Embassy in Wellington. Judd, welcome to New Zealand. It's a pleasure to have you here today. It's good <laughs> to be with you. For those who haven't heard of Chapman University, can you tell us more about it? Well, uh, Chapman's been around a long time, more years than I even know or can count, but the two schools in which I teach, the law school and in the film school, they're relatively new. Chapman is located in Orange, California, and it's about um, 30 miles south of Los Angeles, <laughs> uh, which is ideal, yeah. uh, particularly in the colleges in which I teach, since I teach entertainment law. We enjoy, um, I think, a, a much nicer community where we live and have our campus. And the campus is kind of like going back to happy days. It's kind of like Richie Cunningham yeah. um, uh, feel to it. But we also then can draw on industry professionals up north in Los Angeles who uh, make up a, a big part of our faculty as adjunct professors or often lecturers and we bring them down as guest speakers all the time. Yeah. So we have the best of both worlds. Chapman University's film school is ranked as one of the best in the United States. What can a budding film student expect at the school? The school, uh, under the leadership of Bob Bassett, has really shot up. I mean, it is only eight years old, um, and in that short period of time, it has become fairly well known because the dean has been highly successful in getting funding to build a terrific uh, facility. We have two sound stages, and we have all the cutting edge equipment, and we're, we remain on the cutting edge. And uh, as a result, the students, uh, our reputation has increased substantially every year. Year after year, uh, we enjoy like a 20% increase in applications from the awesome. previous year. Uh, we have 1,500 students, um, and uh, we're bulging at the seams, but new buildings uh, coming out all the time. But we're very proud of it, and we're becoming better known. The law school is also r relatively young. It's only nine years old, and in that short period of time, it has also established a pretty good reputation. I enjoy the opportunity to teach in both because I teach entertainment law, and it's yeah. relevant. To, I started in the law school, but now I also teach in the film school uh, because it's certainly relevant to entertainment. And we're developing much more synergy between the two colleges. Yeah as well as the business school, because business people, lawyers, and um, filmmakers, that pretty much, um, they make up the entertainment industry. And we have those three working together in the way we create our educational experience. Awesome. Do you have many international students at film? We do. Um, we have about 30% of our graduate students are international, and 10% of our undergraduate students um, are international. But one of the reasons I'm down here is none are from down under yet, and, <laughs> and I hope by virtue of this trip that'll change. Um, we're, we're aware that it's a real uh, hot filmmaking community down here, mm -hmm. but because we're relatively new and you're far away, we thought we ought to introduce ourselves to each other. And uh, so far it's been a very good experience, and we're hoping that <laughs> now next year the numbers will change. How would a Kiwi student, or any other student for that matter, go about applying for Chapman University? What are the admission requirements? Well, I don't exactly know how they translate um, uh, for the kind of schooling that you have down here. But it's fairly competitive um, at our, you have to have a pretty high LSAT score. Uh, the average, I think, is, oh, it's 1920. And the average GPA is 3.7. Um, but those, even though there are averages, uh, special circumstances are taken into consideration. All of the application requirements are online. We admit about 30% of those that apply. Um, that may shift and may go lower each year as, as the number of applicants increase. But I think there is special consideration to developing yeah. diversity within the student body by having more international students. I know there's an intent to increase that percentage, particularly at the undergraduate level. 
You've had quite an illustrious career yourself, spanning over three decades. You've worked at Columbia Pictures, 20th Century Fox, Universal Pictures, you know, three of the major six film studios in the entertainment business. To what do you credit your success? <laughs> um, everybody else, I think, just got tired and moved on. <laughs> No, I, I, one of the things that I think is, is probably important in anything you pursue is that you should pursue your passion. Um, my passion was not necessarily law, but it was entertainment, but it's tough to make a living in entertainment. Mm. And uh, when I was in high school, I was in all the school plays and I loved films, um, but my parents were concerned that I couldn't make a good living. So we struck a deal, and the deal was I could go to law school and then after that, I pursued a, an, uh, an opportunity to become a lawyer, an entertainment lawyer, and work with the studios, which was not easy. But once I got my first crack yeah. um, at uh, Columbia Pictures, um, I, I loved it so much that it's been easy to just continue with it and rise up through the ranks. One of the great things that I enjoy is in the practice of law, you're often dealing with conflict. Yeah. But when you're making movies, even though there still is a lot of tension in the deal-making phase, you're helping people create something. Mm -hmm. And working with the uh, creative filmmakers has been probably the most enjoyable aspect of my career. Okay. What sparked your interest in the movie entertainment industry 30 years ago? Probably because I got the part as King Arthur and Camelot in the high school play. <laughs> um, and I had illusions at that time that that was just the beginning of a big acting career. It was an illusion. But I, I, I love film. I love the power of media. And I was also interested not just in film, but I was uh, fascinated with the power of media to influence lives. And that those are some of the things that uh, I have tried to focus on. For example, uh, in my last years at New Line, one of the things we did was we made um, the nativity story. Uh, it was not long after uh, Passion of the Christ had been produced, and there was a huge response, which was unexpected in Hollywood, to that movie. So I petitioned at our studio that we make the nativity story, and we did do that. And I was able to kind of um, uh, participate in an endeavor that I think could uplift people. There's another story. I don't know yeah. if you want to hear these stories. There's a film that we made which is called Life as a House with Kevin Kline. Uh, and it's one of my favorite films, and very few people saw that film. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is that it got an R rating, and yet the message of the film was about family, and it was about a father and son, and it was one of the most touching films that I'd ever seen. One of the things I tried to do with the studio was to try to encourage um, the marketing people to recut it so that we could qualify for a PG-13 rating, but it just somehow didn't quite work, and I think the audience would have tripled at least and that is the audience that uh, probably would have wanted to see that film. So I'm not, I don't even remember your question, but what I love <laughs> um, in being able to participate in film is to sort of uh, get involved with stories that move people yeah. and, can, uh, and change lives. And so how did the law side, I guess, with your parents that came there, how the law side part came into it? Well, I think what is not fully understood is that Hollywood in large part is run by lawyers. Mm. And the reason for that is that it is a very deal-driven industry. Movies aren't made unless deals are struck. Yeah. They're not distributed unless deals are struck. And lawyers are at the center of all of that. And uh, so for that reason, it's no coincidence that at every studio where I worked, um, the studio at that time or immediately after or, or shortly before was headed up by a lawyer. Almost half the time, most of the studio heads are former lawyers because they understand all the elements to bring that are yeah. necessary to bring together to make a movie and to get it seen. You've worked on over 300 Hollywood films, some of which I've mentioned previously. The Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, Wedding Crashes, The Notebook, which is a personal favorite of mine. Can you tell us more about your involvement and your role with making these films? Well, for example, you mentioned The Notebook. What is also uh, not known is that Movies sometimes take a real long time to come mm. together. And uh, after that script came in, we loved it. And, but it sat in our development uh, group for years. And the reason why is that we couldn't bring all the elements together at one time to make it. At one time, Tom Cruise wanted to be in it. And we oh. thought that was great, but we couldn't work <laughs> it out with the schedule. Yeah. At another time, Steven Spielberg wanted to direct it. But we couldn't really figure out the other elements to get the cast that he wanted when he was available to direct. And so it was a, a number of years until we finally brought the group together that did make it. And the two 
Rachel McAdams and uh, well, that other guy that Ryan, all the kids. Ryan Gosling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was he was not who he is today, but we <laughs> we, we can kind of say we discovered him. But they came together. We had a really good director and made a really good movie. Yeah. But I think that's a good example of how it takes a lot of years sometimes for movies to come together. And it also answers the question why a lot of movies are made where people are scratching their heads saying, what were you thinking? And one of the answers is that we didn't have anything else with all the elements of cast and script and director yeah. together at that time. So we ended up with the best choice at yeah. the time. It obviously turned out to be a very good choice too. <laughs> sometimes we're lucky. And, yeah. and some, well, I'll tell you, it's interesting because sometimes we think that we've got a, a winner on our hands. Yeah. We did, as you mentioned, we made the whole Lord of the Rings trilogy. And uh, after we did that, we thought we kind of knew what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we, we realized a fair amount of money from it. And because of that, we invested in an, another um, franchise that we, we thought would, the Golden Compass franchise, which we thought would be really good. Yeah. And I remember, and we spent a lot of money making that. I remember when we were getting ready to distribute it. That week, um, we were told that, and this is part of the game that's played in Hollywood, you pick your distribution date. And, yeah. and on that same date, or the week before, immediately, was the Chipmunk movie. And somebody brought it up, and, we, <laughs> and they thought, oh, don't worry. Nobody's going to want to go see that movie. They're going to want to see our Golden Compass. Well, it was just the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> this movie, in which we had spent uh, well over $100 million in making it, um, did not attract the audience, at least domestically, that we had expected. And mm -hmm. everybody showed up for the Chipmunk movie. Yeah. So there is an old adage in the film industry that was uh, authored by William Goldman when he wrote in his book, Adventures in the Screenwriting Trade. He started out his book with, by saying, nobody knows anything. And it's really true that yeah. as much as you try to anticipate audiences and do your research, there are always surprises. Movies that you think are just going to really take off fail, and movies that you think will never be discovered uh, go through the yeah. roof. During your time working on these movies, did you have much interaction with the cast? You know, have you met anyone famous? I've certainly had my experiences. Um, one that I was just reminded of because I think we shot it down in New Zealand. We were made a movie that very few people saw called Island of Dr. Moreau. Okay. And it, uh, it starred Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer. And um, we had a lot of troubles getting that movie put together. And one day I was leading a meeting uh, with my lawyers and I got a call that Marlon Brando was on. I, my secretary came in and said, Marlon Brando's on the phone and he demands to talk to you. So I went and took the call, and I'd never spoken to him before. I'd negotiated his deal, but generally you deal with their agents and attorneys. And he um, started talking with me and wanted to know. Well, first he started out telling me how his career was just as strong as it ever had been, and that he was not um, uh, fading from the scene. And I, I didn't understand why he, we were having this conversation. Well, after many minutes, it finally came out that he thought I was firing off him off the film. <laughs> Well, I wasn't firing off the film, but I had communicated to his attorney that if he didn't uh, submit to the physical, which was required for insurance, mm. that we had no choice. We had to terminate him. It was a standard provision. Yeah. You know? And he didn't understand that. He thought that we were firing him off the film because the film he'd done just before didn't do very well. Anyway, that was an odd experience. A, a man whose uh, you know, name and reputation I had uh, revered for years, I was suddenly talking to him and he was worrying that I was going to fire him. So that was fascinating. When we made Sex in the City in that series, Sarah Jessica yeah. Parker was one of the producers. And um, I really got a kick out of the fact that she called me a lot. So I would be at dinner with my wife, oh. and suddenly on my <laughs> phone, Sarah Jessica Parker was calling me. But it, it, it depends. On some films, uh, you end up working a lot with some of the cast mm -hmm. and the filmmakers. But for the most part, uh, when you do the legal and the business affairs side, you're dealing with her representatives who... Yeah. defend them, protect them. And mm -hmm. they they usually have a manager, an agent, and an attorney. And I would end up dealing with all three of them all the time. Sounds like a very busy schedule. <laughs> with your um, career trajectory, um, I know that you you know interned at the... Um, ABC News. The ABC News. Can you kind of like talk us through like how you got to the point oh, where you were? That was a great experience. <laughs> I was at the University of Utah, uh, which is an unlikely place to end up at ABC News. And um, there was a, a person who was one of the um, trustees of the University of Utah who um, was also on the ABC board. 
And there was a newsman by the name of William H. Lawrence who had died premature, uh, at a young age. And he wanted to honor him, so he set up a fund. And the purpose of the fund was to select one student from the campus to go back to ABC News once a year and um, participate in the News Bureau uh, sort of a, as an intern, sort of as a fellow. And I didn't know this because I was the first one that was ever selected. Um, and I think I was selected because nobody else knew about it to apply. I was able to go back for six weeks and work at the ABC News um, Center in Washington, D.C. And the great part about that is that I got to pick every day which beat I would go on. So I would frequently pick the White House. And yeah. uh, in those days, it was during the Carter administration, which really ages me. But <laughs> Sam Donaldson was the primary correspondent, and I would go in with Sam, and he'd take me to lunch. But, and I was even uh, able to sit in the uh, cabinet room and, and take a peek wow. into the Oval Office. But it was fascinating oh. to see how the press covered the president. It was, it was very different then. I, re I remember getting involved with the snowball fight with uh, the press secretary, the Hamilton Jordan, the whole press corps was uh, had a, uh, a an impromptu snowball fight with the uh, White House administration. We lost. That's just a literal snowball fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a literal. What, what happened was Carter was going off to uh, he was he was going to fly to um, uh, to the airport to Andrews Air Force Base, mm. but because it was snowing so badly, it couldn't. So they were going to take a motor pool out. So they were allowing the press to just cover him coming out. In those days, he would actually carry his garment back. And we were able to get very close to him. And I was just in the crush of all the reporters. And I remember I could have reached out and touched Carter as he opened the trunk of the limo <laughs> to put his garment bag in. And then they were told to, we were told to just step back. And then the president with his motorcade went down about 50 feet and then stopped before they took off. And we didn't know why. And suddenly then, from the portico behind the pillars, all the uh, some of the staffers from the White House appeared with huge snowballs and they started hurling them at us. <laughs> and I got a big one smack in the <laughs> face from Jody Pal and I couldn't see for about three minutes. <laughs> so that's my claim to fame. Nice. <laughs> and then I guess from ABC News, is that when you then went on to work at Columbia Pictures? I did. Um, and, but that I, I, I worked hard in law school and yeah. did well enough that I was recruited by a good firm, but it was not yet an entertainment firm, but it at yeah. least got me to Los Angeles. And then yeah. when I was there, I would go to various um, seminars on entertainment and to try to find, intermeet people and yeah. see if there was a job out there. And finally, there was a job that I heard about at Columbia Pictures. Mm -hmm. I left the seminar immediately, tweaked my resume, and then the very next day, again, it was before 9-11, I talked my way onto the lot. It was a Saturday. I said I had a special, important uh, letter for the head of the legal department. And they let me on the lot, and I went all the way back, found the office of this guy who, his office door just happened to be open. I put my resume on his chair, and he called me two days later, Monday morning, and he was laughing that I was able to pull that off. So he hired me. And that's how I got my start. Awesome. You worked with New Zealand's own film director, Sir Peter Jackson, on negotiating the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Can you tell us more about your involvement there? Well, I was head of the legal department um, and over business affairs uh, at New Line when we did that, and very a lot of people were involved. But I got very um, specifically involved after Lord of the Rings when we had a lawsuit. Often when there was a lot of money made on movies, lawsuits ensue. There was. And it was standing in the way of our making The Hobbit with Peter Jackson, mm. which was a big issue. Why would you go and make The Hobbit with somebody else after you'd had that experience with Peter Jackson and yeah. his name was so identified with uh, the Tolkien trilogy? So um, I was told to attempt um, to just go through uh, a 10-day right of first negotiation, as, uh, which was his right contractually. But there was not a lot of hope that we would actually reach a deal. Um, in fact, we had a, uh, another director all lined up. But one of the co-chairmen of the studio at New Line um, encouraged me to try harder. They were off at Cannes. And so I sat down and basically turned it into a therapy session with his attorney. And I said, you know, before we even start, I want to know, you know, what are the things that Peter cares about? And yeah. we that started a dialogue that lasted nine months, settled the lawsuit, engaged him um, on The Hobbit, and the rest is history. But I, I, I enjoyed that process. But when you deal with a lot of money and with major talent, yeah. you're dealing with a lot of lawyers and a lot mm -hmm. of issues that are very, very uh, carefully negotiated. That's why it took so long. 
And in the end, it was a success by looks like. <laughs> Which was a real privilege. Yeah. I mean, it was a privilege yeah. to be able to be a part of that whole yeah. uh, era and uh, be involved with such a um, gigantic talent as Peter Jackson. Of all the films you've worked on, what has been a standout for you and why? I, I don't know. I, Austin Powers was fun. <laughs> yeah. Because when Austin Powers, I, I could not name one single film, but I could just name different ones that created different kinds of adventures. Austin Powers was fun because it came through the door and we didn't know that it was going to be uh, anywhere the hit that it was. And it, it grew into actually three different you know, uh, movies with, with all three that we did. Um, Mike Myers is a, an, a, also an enormous talent. He is not credited as the director of the movie. Uh, Jay Roach is, who went on to direct Meet the Fockers and is in his own right a great director. But Mike is a genius who runs everything. I mean, yeah. he acted in it, he effectively produced it, mm -hmm. he wrote it. Uh, and just seeing that kind of talent was pretty amazing. And since I negotiated all those deals, I was involved with kind of uh, knowing all the different hats that he was wearing. But uh, trying to think of what were some of the more meaningful ones. Um, like I said, Life as a House was one that was meaningful to me because it's it makes a difference if you're involved in your career with something that you care about instead yeah. of just the money. Definitely. My job was to be the bad guy and protect the money. Mm. But if I could do it on a film that came together in a way that made me feel proud to be identified with it, it made a big difference. Nice. Do you, so as a, you know, entertainment movie guru as such as yourself, do you have a favorite actor and, or actress? Mm. Or direct, and director? <laughs> You're going to get me in real trouble. Well, I have enormous <laughs> respect for Meryl Streep um, because she's an amazing actress who has played so many different roles so beautifully. So I have real regard for her. I also have a lot of respect for George Clooney. Yeah. And it's interesting. I've never done deals for either of those. I've done deals for a lot of other people that I also have regard for, but those two. Um, one of the reasons why I respect Clooney is how he has used his celebrity to uh, very responsibly in advancing causes that are much more important than just entertainment. Yeah. So I have a lot of regard for him. And also he's been involved with some important movies that um, those movies themselves have been influential. Um, but a favorite actor or favorite actress. I, I had an encounter, I had an experience with Anthony Hopkins and he is a, he's a delight. I had lunch with him once. Uh, it was earlier in his career before yeah. uh, Silence of the Lambs. And I had actually on the side written a script that he had taken an interest in and his wife had at the time. Mm -hmm. And he was meeting with me to hoping that uh, together we could get this movie made. It was never made, probably never should have been made. But I loved meeting with him and he told me at the time that his, he had grown up, um, with his father was a baker and his dad always wanted him to be a baker. And so he started out apprenticing a little bit as a baker. I remember him telling me the story in, in my office and he was standing up and very animated. And he was afraid that uh, when he really decided that what he really wanted to do was act, he was afraid to tell his father that. Yeah. And I remember him sharing with me this story um, that when he told his father, he was apprehensive and his father responded, he said, son, if you love acting as much as I love baking, do it. Yeah. And he did. And I think he's one of our finest actors. We made a movie with, with him too, uh, but a great man. Nice. And so, in your opinion, what are the biggest challenges facing the movie industry? That it's changing. I mean, it's, ch it's challenging and it's exciting because all the um, distribution flap platforms that have pretty much have been fairly rigid for years that you first re release in the movies and then it goes to DVD and it goes to pay television. All these various uh, windows of exhibition and the revenue streams that can be anticipated by them are all shifting because now movies will come out on the internet through um, Netflix in uh, sometimes um, even mm. before they're released theatrically. And as a result, these, these windows are shifting, the revenue streams are changing, the DVD market, which, which skyrocketed and really sustained the industry for a number of years, has flattened out and is in decline. Uh, it's being replaced by online uh, exhibition, but it's not necessarily the same dollars. And so we're in a state of upheaval, but it's an exciting time because, you know, we'll, people still want their entertainment, but they want it now where they want it, when they want it. And that wasn't the case before because they didn't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. They had to wait for the DVD to come out. They had to wait for it to be on pay TV. Yeah. And now it's uh, available everywhere. Part of it, unfortunately, has been fueled by piracy 
and to try to combat that, you know, different systems have evolved, mm -hmm. like the whole problem with um, the music industry. But the, the challenge is we don't know where it's headed, but it's an exciting challenge because yeah. we can be part of the solution instead of just wait to be a victim of it. So even though you're now teaching um, entertainment law, are you still, uh, I guess, involved in the, the processes of the wheeling and dealing kind of thing? <laughs> yes, in, in a couple of respects. Um, I've been called upon a few times to be an expert witness, and oh. um, which is fun to do. I didn't, I didn't really realize that um, it's another thing I hadn't planned on. I hadn't planned on teaching. I love being an expert witness because you're handed a, a, a big uh, volume of documents and you have to figure out the story and to figure yeah. out who did what, when and where, and then a, and opine. And I found that, so I'm involved very much still in, in that capacity. I'm also, one of the exciting things that Chapman Film School is doing is we're making our own movies, we just, uh, which is rare for a film school. We're not yeah. just making student films. This is a regular film intended for commercial uh, distribution. Um, it's called The Barber, and it's starring Scott Glenn. And the dean, who is, is really visionary, decided that this would be a great way to create some employment opportunities for recent alums, and in some instances, actual students. And right now, we, uh, we've engaged a foreign sales agent, who actually just a sales agent, to set up distribution, and, and it's doing much better than one would expect, because Making movies and getting them distributed, getting people interested is tough. Yeah. But we've, first time out the gate, we're doing pretty well. I did all the deals for that, um, just like I did when I was at New Line and all my previous employers. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still involved with that. And also uh, uh, a couple of partners that I have, uh, independent of the university, we're involved with some potential films that may come together too. So I hope to be doing this until uh, they close the coffin. <laughs> Finally, before we wrap up, what's your advice to Kiwi students or any other student for that matter wanting to pursue a career in entertainment law? In entertainment law. Well, um, to get into the best law school you can and do really well in it. Um, but you ought to, if you have that choice, select a law school that has a good entertainment law program, particularly one that has access yeah. to um, the industry itself. That's one of the advantages of Chapman Law School. As I said, we, we're not in the crunch of Hollywood, which is, I think, a hard place to live. Yeah. Um, we're in a great place to live, but we have the advantages and draw upon the um, uh, professional community that make up a large part of our curriculum. Uh, so I would pick a law school that has a great entertainment law program, not only for the education, but for the job opportunities that can be created while you're in school as an intern and immediately coming out of school. And also just do well. Because the better you do, the more choices you create. That's very good advice. Judd, thanks very much for talking to us today. I hope you've enjoyed your time in New Zealand. I, if I could, I'd live here. I'd live here. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. <laughs> oh.